Hello. Welcome to the sixth session of our course on post-colonialism. I hope you all are doing well and will slowly join the session. Our today's conversation will be on Chandra Mohanty's Under Western Eyes. And I'll mostly be focusing on her 1984 article, but do keep in mind that, of course, she's also the author of Feminism Without Borders, besides other books. But this is the book in which she goes and addresses this particular 1984 essay by way of a response. And the essay was published in The Boundary, uh, one of the most prestigious journals, and is considered kind of a groundbreaking post-colonial feminist article. And that's why I chose it. Chandra Mohanty is, of course, one of the most prominent scholars in feminist studies, but also in feminist post-colonial studies. And I thought we should move our conversation towards, you know, how do post-colonial scholars see feminism, especially Western feminism? And if you think in those terms, then this particular essay by Chandra Mohanty and, of course, the book uh, uh, are hugely okay. important. I found this on the web for Essa by Chandra Mohanty. Sorry, that was my phone going off. I don't know why it's looking for something, but <laughs> that's the phones for you. So I will just start, but of course, uh, stop me anytime if you have any questions and we'll see you know, how it goes. And uh, so first of all, in the beginning of the essay, she kind of gives us clear uh, delineation of what is it that she's trying to do. So she kind of focuses on that she will be dealing with only certain books that came out of Z Press. So that is that she's saying, here are six or seven books published under a series on feminism concerning the third word, majority of them by Western scholar. So that's the corpus that she's going to analyze. Right? Her argument is that in her reading, what she has found out is that these feminists treat third world women as a monolithic analytical category, right? And that the project, even though they are trying to write in favor of the third world woman, the project is, is a hegemonic project which sees the positioning of the Western scholar, Western, Western feminists and Western feminism as normal, as central, and against that are they mobilizing this mythological figure called the third world woman, right? And those assumptions is what she is trying to challenge. Uh, uh, and her idea is that this flattening of the third world woman, it has its, you know, its effects. Because what she's saying is that even though these works are written in terms of forming alliances between Western feminists and their third world counterparts, right? Uh, but there is a coherence of effects resulting from the implicit assumption of the West as the primary referent in theory and praxis, right? That what comes across then is that the Western scholar, feminist scholar herself becomes the referent, becomes the point, the real thing against which everything else on the third world is measured. And that the third world woman in these works is imagined as monolithic without class differences and without you know, differences of region. There's a lot of generalization going on. So what is her main assertion then? And I will read it. I would like to suggest that the feminist writings I analyze here discursively colonize the material and historical heterogeneities of the lives of women in the third world, thereby 
producing or representing a composite single third word woman. So there are two movements going on, right? First of all, the, 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 the col speaking about the third world woman without her consent, but about her as a general category itself is an imperial practice. It is the same old Eurocentric model of speaking for the Orient or for any other places without acknowledging you know, the, the nuances of separate cultures in different places and class structure that is in itself an imperial act, but now being done by the Western feminists, right? And in that process, the figure about whom these people are talking, the third world woman itself becomes a composite figure created by this discourse of feminism. That is, you know, the pernicious effect of that. Let me go to the comments and see what people are saying and welcome you all. And then I'll come back to, to the discussion. So Mansoor Adil, welcome. Hina, welcome. Oroko, welcome. Great. So you're here from Kenya. Fahmida Ji, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. And as I said, please uh, feel free to post any questions that you might have. Now, what she's saying is that there are three ways in which she's going to look at these texts. One, how is it that these texts treat woman, singular, as a category of analysis? Two, what kind of methodological universalism is employed by these Western scholars? And three, who is the subject of power in this entire discourse? These are the three analytical categories under which she's going to discuss this practice of feminist writing about the third world. And within woman as a category of analysis, then she gives us five different ways in which different authors, all published by Z Press, have represented third world women from different perspectives, right? And first, and that is the main category where woman itself. So what do we mean by woman as a category of analysis is where you generally assume that the gender woman, we all are, are, are come under that gender as a woman and hence we inherit and practice a natural solidarity amongst ourselves, which is uncomplicated because since we are all women, our lived condition is the same and our oppression is the same and hence we constitute already a category which can be studied and where solidarities can just be developed between Western women and third world women because they are women. That is gender as a category of analysis that you don't go below that and see how that discursive gender is discursively created. And under this category, there are five ways in which the third world women are represented in the works of these feminist scholars. And the first is women as victims of male violence. Okay, so throughout these five categories that she talks about, there is one question that she's constantly posing, right? And that question is the question of third world woman. That when the third world woman enters the discourse of these scholars, these feminists, she's already constituted. What does it mean? What it means is that her status as a victim is already constituted. Her status as a silent person is already constituted. They take that as existent and then extrapolate from that. What's the problem in that? Right. The problem in that is that if you already see the third world women as victims, then you don't spend much time on the discursive practices that got them there or your own assumptions about calling all of them victims. You can take that as pre-constituted as a stable signifier and then just prove how they are victimized. That's the subtle difference that we need to read in this essay, right? So, 
so women as victims of male violence. So in, in, in this case, then what she does is that when this category of scholarship is done by Western women, um, then the study is mostly already, it, it plays with existing hierarchies, right? In which men are naturally posited as oppressors and women are naturally posited as oppressed. And, and they are, the problem with that is that in that case, there is of course a, a huge generalization going on. We're talking about women from majority of the planet, but their place as victims is, is pre-constituted and frozen in time. And that what that does is because the feminist scholar is seeing these women already as being victims, not much goes into the study of victimhood and different ways of violence, right? But what goes into is representing them as victims. So what she says is defining women as archetypal victims freezes them into objects who defend themselves, men into subjects who perpetrate violence. So, so this agonistic idea that men are always violent and third world women are always victimized is completely normalized in this kind of analysis where women is taken as a category of analysis. Um, and it is a little beyond from women as a category of analysis because now the sisterhood is also not just built in that we are all women, but it's also built in that we are also victims, right? So that's one um, way in which feminists, and she cites the exact works of who writes like that. The second way of representing the third world women in these texts that she's talking about is third world women constitute an identifiable group poor purely on the basis of shared dependencies. So uh, feminists who write about third world women in this category they basically already assume that the third world women, regardless of their class, their region, uh, their financial abilities, that they, uh, th the reason they are third world women are because they are dependent on the family, familial structure, they are dependent on their parents. What it then represents is again, third world women as a category which monolithically be considered just a universal dependent, right? Uh, and because of this, I mean, there is a lot of flattening going on. And she gives an example of uh, a study of uh, theory of kinship, right? Uh, amongst Bamba women, right? And what she's talking about is that their value is only through exchange, right? That if they are adult, if they have been initiated, then their value is through exchange, through marriage. But the problem is that, that even that experience for a Western feminist is only measured in terms of women's dependency, right? The matrilineal aspects of these societies are elided and not talked about. So this is the second subject under which women are studied by Western feminists. And then there is women and familial systems. Now the Western feminists, remember this is 1980s, okay. The Western feminists who study third world women, then they also see that they are also oppressed within the familial systems. Right? So that oppression is totally generalized, that they are either wives, they are either mothers, they are not seen as autonomous beings. And then this branch of scholarship then basically suggests that all the pre-modern familial systems are naturally oppressive to women and that third world women all fall into the same category. And then women and religious ideologies this is the study of Arab women and Muslim women who are usually conflated. And in this kind of study by another scholar, here Islamic ideology is reduced to a set of ideas whose internalization, and this is the study of the Pirzada women, contributes to the stability of the system. So in, in religious ideologies, then the idea is that 
women of the third world who are from Islamic countries or even Christian cultures are also constantly oppressed by their own religions and that also enhances or creates their victim status. And then the final version is, is when, when women and their condition is looked at from an economic developmental point of view. And in that sense, then there is a dichotomy that's created between men and women and how men have all the resources and women don't. And their humanhood, right, or womanhood is measured in terms of where they are in that developmental process. And of course, what Mohanty is saying is that the standard of that developmental process, access to education, access to jobs, is already normalized as the Western feminist standard. And, and they don't read the nuances of the local cultures. And here she, she gives an example of Maria Myers, who went and studied the lace makers of Narsapur. The lace makers of Narsapur, of course, in India, are a community of Muslim women who, per, who of course, uh, perform parda, and they don't go out, right? And Myers goes and studies because the lace makers are a huge part of, of the lace making industry. And these are women who like crochet these doilies, right? Which are then given to a middleman who exports them to Europe, these little fringes that people put on their chairs and all. So they, and so what she's saying is, okay, here is someone who actually did the right kind of study, right? Who didn't just take these women as victims of patriarchy, right? That they stay at home and just make doilies. But this, scholar Maria Mahes goes and studies as to, first of all, how is this system operating where the global corporations through middlemen commission women to do this work, right? How is this work sold to them? It is sold as making supplemental income, extra money while still being in Parda, right? And so it's connected to housework, but just making some additional money on the side, but their production actually is helping this whole industry. But within that, then she goes and interviews these women because she doesn't just want to say, oh, the men are making them do that. Or global capital is making them do that. She asks for their opinions. What do you think the, you know, these women, you are from middle class and there's like, yeah, we don't even, go out. But when asked whether would they would they like to go out and be able to work, their answer is absolutely yes. If we could go out and work like these women who otherwise are from lower classes, yes, we will do that. So that kind of representation then offers the third world woman in a particular scenario with someone who has her own ideas and her own understanding of how the local economy works or how they are being exploited. And that's the category in which she also mentions um, also how for some feminists then a lot of things are conflated. Like she gives you one example where women from uh, Egypt, Algeria, Syria, India, and Bangladesh are grouped together as a single monolithic group who all uh, share same kind of oppression, right? So her critique then uh, then is not necessarily that there is no victimhood or that there is no oppression going on, right? Her critique is, first of all, that the third world woman comes to these feminists already constituted as a victim. Right. So that is the only way they see them. Right. So if that is the only way you see them, then you don't pay attention to the discourse. You don't pay attention to the economic discourse or other discourses that are producing these subjectivities. But also. You already assume that you are on a different 
temporality that you're on a different developmental structure and you become the referent yourself. You become the norm, not realizing that the same oppressions are operative within the Western societies as well, right? Uh, the wage theft or the double shift and all of those. So her argument then throughout this text is, uh, is of course the Eurocentricity of the Western feminists, but this assumption on the part of these feminists who are writing in some ways in solidarity with the third world women is was first of all over generalization, like and seeing the third world women as pre-constituted as victims, not seeing the class hierarchies. For example, when she talks about the discussion of the veil and hijab, uh, one scholar absolutely equates it with all the other forms of oppression, including race, uh, rape, and violence. And her po um, Chandra Mohanty's point is that you can't read hijab as a monolithic practice, right? Because it is also associated with class. In, in Egypt, there are different reasons for women to take hijab. In Saudi Arabia, it is implemented by the state, of course. In Turkey, it's completely voluntary, right? So all of these things and that hijab automatically doesn't mean that the woman you're thinking about is absolutely not a subject and has no will of her own and cannot think, right? Because depending on where you are, which culture you are, you will you could find in Pakistan, majority of educated women, you know, who have jobs and everything else still cover their heads, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean either that they are victims or that they have no free they have no ideas of their own or they are not agents in their actions. By implying that anyone who covers themselves is by its very nature a victim and not a subject already flattens the class hierarchies. She gives the ideal example of uh, this, that does that mean that, you know, the middle class housewives in Egypt who wear hijab, their politics and the politics of their maids is the same. They, they share the same kind of oppression. Obviously not. So overall in the essay and also in the book, and the reason the essay became so big was that it took on seven different books by a feminist press. The argument isn't that there is no oppression or no sexual division of labor. The argument is, is, is first of all, not seeing the discursive practices that produce different divisions of gender. The argument is of taking gender as pre-constituted and as already defining, you know, uh, the role, monolithic role of a huge mass of society. And then centering the Western subjectivities or Western ways of looking at as the norm, but also as the referent of that discourse. So these are some of the things that she's highlighting. Uh, of course, when you read the book, obviously the last chapter of the book is revisiting, but some of the things that she discusses in the book also uh, is is starting with how the third world women is seen, what kind of third world feminism has developed. And then in the book, she, she then has a whole chapter or section on decolonizing feminism, where she re-theorizes feminist thought or practices, you know, from a post-colonial point of view, from a point of view of the so-called third world women who were being represented in 1980s by the feminist authors. Now remember, this challenge to Western feminism also came from within United States and Britain as well, where uh, the, the Caucasian feminists were already assuming a sisterhood of all women. And then the African-American and minority feminists came out and said, no, you know, that is the, where the standpoint theories of feminism come into play. Because these women come in and say, no, your experience and our experience is not the same. We are not necessarily sisters. You still have a more privileged position and more power in that society. So this, this break or division 
already existed within Western feminism. So what the, she then also highlights is, is the hegemonic power of Western publishing industry, right? So that it's not that the third world women or feminists or others are not publishing, but the European presses, European Academy, and hence the European feminist and American feminist placed here, publishing here, already have a privileged place because they, if not own, they basically have access to all these publishing venues, all these journals. So they already have sort of a monopoly on the discourse within which very rarely when she was writing in 1984 are the voices of minority women or the third world women heard, right? Now, what she's in the revision of the essay when she revisits it in the book, she highlights it pretty clearly that her intent wasn't that there is a break and Western feminists cannot work in solidarity with third world feminists. She, she points to the places in the essay where she clearly states that, no, I am arguing against this hege hegemonic impulse of the Western feminists, but I'm constantly also suggesting that we can work in solidarity with each other, learn from each other, and then inform each other. And so that streak in her scholarship is constant, right? It is not uh, ethnocentric. It is not nativist. It believes that if we clearly understand each other's positions and particularities of each women group's situations, we can work in solidarity with each other. That possibility is always there in her work. So let me go to the questions. Could you please discuss cultural studies in next lesson? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not an expert on cultural studies. Uh, and since I, you know, I, I don't know what it is as a field of study, it will be very hard for me to do that because cultural studies over here is a, a field of study and people specialize in it. They have their own canon, their own texts. Uh, but on the other hand, whatever I am doing here, whatever we are discussing can very easily be form of cultural studies. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Shrimsta. Okay, Dania Asif, love, so absolutely love you. Thank you. Oh, I have a question. Does Spivak strengthen white narrative for third world women as being constant victims? But I don't think so. I mean, you should go read Spivak. I mean, uh, I, I don't, I, I find Gayatri Spivak to be one of the most formidable scholars in the world. And it, it baffles me that people can reduce her to one or two sentences in order to ever have an opinion on Gayatri Spivak for any scholar in this world. I would first encourage them to go and read her books and then go and read who she cites and who she has read. And then maybe we will have an opinion on that. As far as I am concerned, I find her work to be deeply, deeply political and highly impactful. Uh, Okay, when will I continue with the Orientalism readings? Uh, probably next week or two. We are at a very busy time in our semester right now uh, because the midterms are due and then we are moving towards finishing the semester. And to be very honest, the Saeed lectures and uh, uh, Freire lectures, they take a lot of time to prepare. Even though I've read Orientalism, I don't know, 50 times, but every two, three paragraphs or five paragraphs or five pages that I read, I have to seriously prepare for them. So probably next month or sometimes this month, um, but I'll try my best to do that. Uh, okay, any other questions about Chandra Mohanty and what we, what we read uh, read today. Now also keep in mind that since 1984, 
of course, quite a lot has been added to feminist debates, right? So there are people like Leila Abu Loga, like Maria Fatima Marnisi, the African feminists, African American feminists who have entered the debate, right? And Chandra Mohanty herself, you know, is a big name in feminism, um, and 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 the head of the women's studies at Syracuse. So it's not like um, you know, the conversation is stopped. And I think the that feminism has become more nuanced to the grounding in regions in different parts of the world, right? And, 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 and this essay, when it came out in Boundary, that's the reason it, it, it generated such huge discussion because it called into questions the very assumptions of what we would consider liberal feminists, right? Okay, so infinita. All right, so I will, I will, <laughs> I will try to come up with some more lectures on Orientalism. Since it's a reading, I will continue producing, you know, short lectures so that we can keep reading. Yeah, uh, I agree. No one, I mean, the reason I'm using third word here is because that was in the text. It was in 1984. Uh, otherwise, no one uses the term third word or first word anymore. But uh, there is an attempt for it to be, remember third word was never ever a, 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 a negative term. Third word at one point was offered as an alternative to the two world theory okay, in the 1960s and 70s. And it was led by the non-aligned movement and it was politically very potent in the United Nations General Assembly. It is now that when we look back at it, we consider it a, a negative term. Uh, and that also because it lost its political power in the world. But the reason we are using it here in this context is because it is part of the title of the essay. And remember, when it is 1984, when the essay is published, 1984, third world was still a potent term. And it, it, it's, it hadn't yet become the term that it is now. Uh, so there is no need to suggest that we should stop using it because most of us don't use it in that sense anymore. Um, Kinza, thank you. Welcome. Okay, any other questions? So what I, I want you to uh, keep in mind is that uh, these sessions uh, are based in reading, right? Because I put up the reading bef a week before. And uh, basically the hope is that people will read these texts and uh, then have questions about the text itself. But uh, another thing that uh, she indicts the Western uh, scholars for in this essay and also in the book is, is the methodological universalism. And by that, what she means is, is that by and large, these seven or eight books that she read basically assume certain norms that are Western and juxtapose against them the, the norms that they assume about the third world women, right? But those norms are, are made into this monolithic victim status and they erase the particularities of different cultures and class hierarchies. And within that, then who emerges as the subject of power, right? Subject of power in this, if it is a discourse, right? if things are discursively produced, if subjectivities are discursively produced, in that discourse then, then the third world woman in 1984 in these texts emerges as a perpetual victim pre-constituted. And, and when she says pre-constituted, the idea behind that is that she is not being seen as an outcome, as a subjectivity that comes out of a discourse of power, right? And, and politics. 
and economics, right? Because if that is the focus, then our focus won't be this is what is being done to this monolithic third world woman. Our focus will then be the politics that create gender, that create gender divisions. So at one point in the essay, she also points out is that sexual div sexual division of labor, what men do and what women do is already posited as an oppressive setup, right? Pre-constituted as such, right? And she points to that, well, you know, that exists over here too, right? But it is assumed as, as if the Western feminist has overcome the sexual division of labor, but her third world counterpart is still caught within it. So it's basically overall, when you read the essay, it's a brilliant critique of any kind of Eurocentric generalizations about the figure of the woman in what was then called the third world. And now euphemistically, we call it the developing world. But as I said earlier, no one actually uses the term third world. Um, so, Hina, how is global feminism different? Well, I mean, if you look at whichever culture you are, wherever you are, women are fighting for their own rights politically. They have their own activism. They have their own leaders. Some of them are arguing from within their own religious traditions. Some of them are taking ideas from the West, modifying them to their local culture and then trying to change the politics. Some of them are working in solidarity with men. So the, to assume a general monolithic division between men being always oppressors and women being always victims is a terrible disservice to that. So that is how they are different. Now, if you go to Africa, in most African countries, there are different kinds of feminisms at play. There is womanism, where African women have theorized their own role in the society and their practice, and they fight with that. In Islam, if you want to see Muslim feminists, right? They have no problem wearing hijab, right? But all they're fighting for is we have the right to the public sphere. We should be able to enter it. We should be able to work in it. So there are different kinds of fights at different level. And then, of course, religious ideology also goes counter to that. How is it nuanced? How would it fail if we just picked up the Western feminism and its assumptions and just tried to fight over them in any Islamic country. I mean, the easiest thing that the mullahs and everyone else will do is there's like, this is a Western idea. So how do you dismantle that discourse by particularly understanding it? And then you dismantle it within the discourse of religion itself by pointing to things that already say that what the men are saying or what the patriarchal men are saying is wrong. Now, of course, there are other options as well. Right. That's why I love Marxism. Right. Because the basic entry into it is a denial of any metaphysical identity. I mean, it basically says this is the material world. That is all I know. I don't care if something beyond me exists or not. So that's why Marxism has been and will always be the only potent threat to religious ideologies, because right at its door, when you enter it, you have to jettison any religious ideas about nature and the world. No other philosophy can do that. And that's why people work from within their philosophies, from within their religious traditions. Um, but we can learn from each other. That's the point, instead of mandating it from the West. How can the global slogan of sisterhood suit? Well, she is not raising that slogan. What she's saying, saying is that that is what is assumed by these feminists whom she's criticizing, that they assume a generalized global sisterhood. Now, of course, Spivak writes about it. She calls, calls it uh, uh, sororism uh, or sorality, right? Sisterhood. But even Spivak, of course, is careful enough not to assume that there is a global sisterhood. But can it be developed? Absolutely. How? It can be developed with me saying, this is what I believe in, this is you believe in. Let's build a solidarity where we keep our differences, but we work in solidarity. Absolutely, it's just like any other model of resistance in the postmodern world. 
you don't believe in a centralized hierarchy. You don't believe in a centralized party. Resistance is diffuse. All you'd say is, if you are fighting for this over here, tell me what I can do for you over here. How should I address it? You learn from your other groups, but you can develop a sisterhood all over the world where women collectives work together and say, well, sister, this is our fight. This is what we need from you. So that that can absolutely a nuanced, nuanced kind of global sisterhood politics can be developed. It will need a politics, right? It will need a, a way of working through the economy, but possibility is still there. The only thing that people like Chandra Mohanty and Spivak will not agree with is for, for it to have a center and for it to have a one monolithic belief system. Right, we are way past that, so that won't work. Good. So, has the figure of the third world women in terms of oppression changed at all? Because every day there is a new unimaginable hurdle. Uh, well, I mean, the situation, the particular situations of women, I would say, have not changed. Right, they are still struggling and fighting. The only difference is that we can't just universalize that. We can't say every third world woman has the similar kind of oppression and the similar kind of fight because class plays a role against it, right? There are women in powerful positions. There are women who are not in powerful positions. And that allows us this newest approach to it. To assume a general victimhood would say that they all share the same kind of material conditions. But the fight is still there, even over here. I mean, the fight is not done, right? Women still get paid less than men. They still face you know, sexual harassment at, at works. The only difference is that maybe they can access more laws, they can access more you know, security, the institutions are more concerned about that. But the fight is still on right depending on where you are i will never assume that that the fight against patriarchy everywhere in the world has ended no and that it needs to continue on and then within the women's movement themselves there are internal oppressions also right where women themselves go and oppress other women and you all from south asia already probably know about it uh, do you think perhaps all these remarkable feminist texts need to be revisited? Yeah, absolutely. That's what Chandra Mohanty is doing. She is saying, hey, don't think of the third world women as a monolithic figure. Don't think of her as a perpetual victim. But even if that is the case, be particular of the situation where you are, what class, what religion, you know, which region. I mean, even if, if you look at Pakistan, right? Um, they can work in solidarity with each other, right? But women in Lahore and Karachi, they have different kinds of oppressions, but their lives are qualitatively, depending on their class, are much different than maybe women in, in the very rural parts of Balochistan and KPK, right? Now, I'm not saying one is more oppressed than the other, but depending on where you are, what infrastructures are there, what education is available. So, Oppression, oppression is operative, but we cannot just say that it's a singular oppression. We have to make sure that we account for the particularities of it. Because if we do so, then those women can be participants in terms of their voice, in terms of their stories. But then the remedies that are offered or politics that is offered is nuanced towards that. That's the difference between overgeneralizing and particularizing a lived experience, in my opinion. Don't you think some women are misusing feminism for, is it, I don't care what they're misusing it for. If it makes them, if it makes them freer and if it makes them create a world in which they can live, 
a meaningful life without someone telling them how to live their life, I will never really consider a misuse. Men have misused the word all their life, right? They have used religion. They still can throw a book at you and say, God says you must be like this. I don't care what women use it for as long as it's, it is towards you know, more freedom, more access to public sphere, more equal, equality, uh, right? And uh, I don't see it as a misuse. Uh, I feel like the way oppression of women is perceived, even in the celebrated text, largely only represent one. Yeah, it's mostly, uh, I mean, most of the times people writing these books themselves are bourgeois liberals, right? They are middle class women. They can sometimes write in solidarity with other women. But what she's highlighting is the generalizations that these women make, right? Over generalizations. So a better way would be as Spivak would teach us is, you know, you go and live with the people. If you really want to speak for a people, you can't speak it from the well, maybe uh, you can lend them power through your own position, but the ideal form of activism is where, where you where you work in solidarity with with a group, right? And you learn from them of their own oppression. You just you don't just theorize about it. Uh, so examples of it you could see in your own lives. You know, people, women activists, and others who go into the rural communities, um, work with women, learn of their lived conditions right? And, and then fight alongside them. That is the subtle difference or, or just having an opinion, you know, from the comfort of your own home, which is great. You're still producing knowledge, but the ideal would be when you actually hear the stories and, and talk to these women. And then if you have the power to represent it, yes, you know, if you're a journalist, write that story because that's the power you have of representation. Why not? You know, why do you, why do you, sh should you just feel like, oh, I don't have the right to say, no, you need the permission of the victim to tell the story, but you can always stand in solidarity with anyone, right? When they are fighting against oppression, nothing stops you from that. And that is the whole idea of solidarities that you don't have to have similar points of view or identities or class. The solidarity is where you say, I am here, you are over there, I acknowledge your fight, and this is what I can do with you, right? And that's how you build solidarity. Is that idea where you believed in a centralized political party, communist party, and fought for the rights of the labor, those days are over. There is, after Stalin, we've already learned that that's the biggest trap you can fall into. Uh, Yes, so, so what we learn then is that there are different kinds of oppressions, but oppression, the figure of the oppression is not pre-constituted because oppression happens because of the political, because of the cultural power at play. And if we understand that, then we won't just study the victim, we will study, you know, the determining causes of that. If, if uh, it's very easy to say such and such is a sexist society and then keep writing about it, the more deeper kind of scholarship is would be to understand what underwrites that sexism, what discourses, what laws, right? Because then we understand how are men and women constituted within that discursive situation. Because if we understand that, then we can change it, right? But if we, if, if we just take these two figures as these two antagonistic figures and fix them in place, then we are not actually addressing the, the thing that produces them, the discourse that produces them. And that is her point, I think, here, is that instead of taking the third world women as perpetual victims, right, let's just complicate it. What class, what region, you know, if you're in India, what caste? What are the other determinants of that victimhood, right? Instead of just blanket assertion of that. Good. So yeah, I mean, um, the 
the questions that we need to ask and uh, you know all of us are of course we live in this world and, and you know we live in a in a highly divided stratified world right and i will be the last person to ever assume that the fights of rights of women and genders female subjects are over right and and uh, remember over here too we in america we now have things called the men's rights movements right these are people men who are afraid that their jobs are being taken over by women so of course there are those retaliatory politics involved there right so sexism of that kind is on the rise and here also you know the churches the conservative churches will use the vocabularies of their god to tell women that they, there is a certain role that they must play and uh, in india those of you have who have joined us there the the extreme right wing uh, people are trying to tell indian women what constitutes hindu womanhood right um, there are instances even in bombay and other places where these young men who are aligned with a certain specific political party i mean they run into bars right and beat up couples who are sitting just having their coffee or whatever assuming that they are having illicit relationships you go to pakistan the case is even more severe uh, you know you have to have your nikah nama in your pocket when you are in a park so so all of these are different ways by an established patriarchal body of law religious or secular trying to defend its own stability against these constant onslaught of differences upon it because how do you build a stable system right through through exclusions how do you build a family system which can go on saying that if men and women were equal the basic balance of the society will be disturbed think of it for a moment what you are actually then saying is that the society can only be maintained through an unjust system in which one party in an equal relationship has more power over the other right and that is such a tragic way sad way of thinking about life where i often hear from people uh, my friends in pakistan is like look at america it's an immoral country they have a 52% divorce rate right that makes sense but on the other hand i was like yeah i wish it was higher why because if you're a guy and you treat your wife terribly she's not going to sit down and cry and come back to you or her parents are not going to tell her no 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 your honor is in that stay with this terrible man who beats you up no if you're rude to your wife or your partner she's going to look into your eye and say hey dude i want a divorce and i'll take half of your property with me and if i have children for as long as i don't get married and they are not adults you'll also provide child support and if you don't provide child support you will go to jail right that is why the divorce rate is high because women don't have to sit and take it right no that shapes men's behavior too of course there are violent and oppressive men in america too but by and large if you look at our young men on our campus they know that there is a social stigma attached to the idea that they are harassers right that they will have no social life if they are found whistling at a woman or doing terrible saying bad things but that there are legal ramifications for that too right so i'm not saying america is an ideal society what i'm saying is that there are laws in place there is no stigma attached to divorce right and women by and large can rely on some kind of help right which enables them to be more assertive right and to to say we are equal and we will not be mistreated so th that is when we look at behind a discourse right uh, so if you wanted to say why do certain men become sexist and um misogynistic we can either say all men are sexist or misogynistic or we go into the discursive practices in which that masculinity is created 
and then see what what is it that these men are internalizing as their right within a given society and if that is what they are there is no amount of lecturing is going to change their behavior unless we shift those structures unless we alter them and create environments within which we can produce more egalitarian better men right so that is the difference between thinking something as pre-constituted as oppressed and oppressor or looking at the discursive politics culture that produces those subjectivities and i think that is what she is pointing to in this essay um, yeah um, it always is a laughing thing for me when men march for their rights because you know in a way wherever we are most cultures are still pretty hierarchically male dominant uh, or in kenya we have a debate on implementation of two by three gender rule that has been enshrined in the constitution um, i don't know what it means but feel free to explain it but uh, that is so true on the divorce rate and how Pakistanis like to throw that into. Yeah, I know. Um, it it uh, it kind of makes sense to them. But, when, but, but what I did about that divorce rate debate was not take it as a fact or as a pre-constituted fact, right? And I'm trying to like give you a little bit of training. What I went into was what is under it, what underwrites it, what's behind it, right? When you put that into perspective, then that fact, the figure that they, the Molvies and others mobilize certainly falls flat because you realize that the divorce rate is not connected to immorality. It is connected to women's right to say, I'm done. You know, you're a terrible human being. I don't want to be with you. How many women, if you live in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, I have known so many highly educated women, right, who were in terrible marriages, right, and could not afford to lose their, leave their husbands because they had young children and they had no access to any kind of state help or other help or their families were not supporting, right? In my own life, I've experienced that. Now, I'm not saying Pakistan is a terrible country or no. What I'm trying to highlight is that when we look at these particular situations, then we realize that there are always underlining features. A woman might want to leave her husband, but cannot because she doesn't know where she will live. She doesn't know who will take care of. She doesn't know whether her children will be safe, right? Now, what does that then teach us if we are going to fight the gender fight is let's have laws on the table that say, okay, if you have nowhere else to go, the government shall provide you a safe place to stay a shelter, there will be some organizations, government or private, who are there to take care of single mothers, right? So that there is an infrastructure. Once you build that infrastructure, once you have a body of laws protecting your right to be, right, then it creates a human subjectivity in terms of a woman who can take that drastic step. The only way you create a docile human female body is by taking away from her all the support systems, then she is totally dependent. Then she has become the dependent that these women talk about. And that happens through law, through its implementation, through a civic society which believes in equality. And any idea that people say that uh, gender equality destroys family harmony. I mean, my wife is, and I have been married for 16 years, man. And we are absolute equals. And we have one of the most loving marriages. I know a personal anecdote is not data, but I've seen so many other people like that, right? It absolutely doesn't destroy family harmony. Um, so I wish the kind of thinking that is in America also, uh, well, th th let us not generalize America as well. I mean, what I'm saying is that at least in terms of law, family law, we have laws here that protect women, right? But despite all that, you know, domestic violence is a huge issue in America, right? Um, 
poverty is a huge issue in America. Single motherhood is a huge issue in America. So what I'm not denying is that these problems do exist. But on the other hand, there are civil organizations, government organizations, right, churches who make sure that if you're a single mom, maybe you'll have shelter. Um, there are battered women shelters, right? But that already presupposes that domestic violence is a fact of life, right? So what I'm suggesting is that <coughs> culturally, there is no taboo on divorce, right? No one thinks, oh my God, I'm going to getting divorced. What are people going to think about me? So maybe that is progress, right? But the problems do exist. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that the situation is not getting better because people are fighting for it. So exactly the same case could be in other countries. But how could Western feminism help that, If, as Chandra Mahanti would say, is, is by working in solidarity with feminists everywhere and not necessarily by coming top down and saying, this is how we do things here. This is how you should do it. That is will be what he she will call an imperial way of dealing with it. So question, where do you see the exploitation of real in the well <laughs> that's a huge debate, but pick up any religious text, the Bible, the Torah, the Vedas, the Quran, right? These are all male dominant texts, right? They privilege men. There is no doubt about that. And that is what basically tells you is that these are probably not universal texts. But since men interpret them, and since most of these texts privilege a male subjectivity, and if you are fighting for your rights as a woman, and you believe in the same faith, then you know, all they need to do is point you to like a certain verse in the Torah and a certain verse in the Bible or the Quran to say, this is what God wants you to do. So what do you do at that time? Scholarly speaking, women have gone into sacred texts and reread them and written books about them. Those of you who are from Muslim country, I, I strongly recommend uh, Fatima Marnisi's Women and Islam. If you want to see someone completely destroy the male dominance argument, um, if you want to read in Urdu, there is an 1898 text by Malana Mumtaz Ali, who basically takes all the claims about male superiority from the Quran, especially from Surah An Nisa, and, and basically logically and theologically destroys that argument. Um, what's the importance of that, having those texts? Because you can mobilize those texts to fight for your own rights if you're fighting from within a discourse, right? If the option isn't, I'm going to denounce this and go and find something else, then you go to the text and deconstruct it and point it out to them. The question is, you know, how permissible would that be in a given culture, right? It's like sometimes speaking about these issues is, sacrilegious. And it's not just Islam, Christianity, Judaism, they all do that. Uh, sir, how can the Western solidarity be extended to the Eastern world when there is a day? Well, I mean, that's a huge generalization. Um, the West is a complex place. There are solidarities in practice right now. You know, and don't think of nations. There are people here raising funds for people elsewhere, working together. Uh, there are small organizations who share knowledge. There are organizations who share um, uh, cultural knowledge, political knowledge. There are organizations who lobby for the interest of their counterparts everywhere. So it's not West as a monolith and East as a monolith. There are global solidarities at play. I mean, if you go to World Social Forum every year, uh, there are people from, you know, 100 different countries. It depends on what kind of solidarity do you want to build. At any moment, if you're a scholar and you write to a feminist scholar in United States and say, I can't find your this essay, could you please send it to me? That is an act of solidarity on her part. So it's not how is it possible is 
it is happening already, right? The question is, can we make it even larger? Can we make it more enduring, right? That is the question is question of scale. And um, on my part, I don't really think about East and West, right? These are two huge categories with so much complexity and nuance, right? And, and in, in my opinion, you know, I am happy to borrow steal ideas from any tradition as long as I can mobilize them for any kind of liberation. Okay, infinita. Even though we have laws for protecting women, we will still have serious problems with inequality and abuse in Spain and religion plays a big role. Absolutely, I agree with you. And it's the same, same the cases in United States where I live is depending on your class, your race, your ethnicity, the region where you live in. Um, not all the fights for women's rights have been fought and won. You know, women are still in deeply precarious situations, right? And, and if you take it a little further, people who, who are women and men, right, then uh, who are lesbians, who are gay, who are transgender, they have to then deal with other legal ramifications, other aspects of oppression, depending on your race. You know, if you're African-American, <clears throat> your experience is also different. So absolutely, even though there are laws and resources and organizations, uh, these kind of oppressive violence still exists over here. And no one in the United States in their right mind would claim, or in Spain or elsewhere, that they have solved all their problems. And I think that's the basic thing, is to acknowledge that these problems exist, because only then we can continuously keep fighting about, fighting against them. And that's why I don't absolutely believe in this man-woman dichotomy. I think for any org activism, any kind of activism to really change the gender dynamics, we will have to incorporate men into it. We will have to retrain men, right? And ask them to think of the world differently. But men and women can also absolutely work in solidarity to change the world. Right, and that's where that antagonistic position between men and women needs to be kind of made more fluid. Where we say we will take, we will accept men in solidarity if they are willing to learn from us. Right, not men coming in and taking over the movement and patronizing us, but men who come with a certain degree of humility and say, "I would like to work with you. Tell me what to do." Right? That kind of man. But also how to reconstruct masculinity itself, which is a main problem, right? Um, okay, so that's all I have today. We have gone for one hour. So overall, just to conclude, um, please do read the essay. It's one of the most significant essay written in 1984. But if you find some time, pick up her book, Feminism Without Borders, and do read it carefully because it might, may not be the final word on post-colonial feminism, but the ideas that she shares with you and the way she explains her concerns, I think are still pertinent and can teach us a lot of different ways of looking at feminism in general, but particularities of solidarities amongst different feminisms, right? And post-colonial feminisms. And I think that's something that we all should learn. So that's all I have. Um, so I will announce soon enough what we'll be doing uh, next week. If you all have any suggestions, you know, please always send them my way. And uh, I will also post this as an edited version uh, later and you can come back to it. But um, uh, if everything goes well, uh, next week will be our seventh session. Uh, so that's already half a class, right? But I hope you're enjoying it. I really uh, look forward to these meetings. And as always, whenever you have any questions, please send, send, send them my way. 
And uh, I will take one last question. Can Su uh, can Sufism Sufism work as an anecdote against the male? Uh, yes and no. Yeah, if if you are into like real Sufism, uh, there are mazars of Sufia in India where women are not allowed in the inner sanctum. So if Sufism could solve the gender problem, uh, the easiest way of answering that question is if women can enter the Holy Kaaba and the Prophet's mausoleum in Masjid in Nabawi, how is it that they can't go into Hazrat Ali Ajwari's inner sanctum? So for as long as Sufis keep insisting that women cannot enter a certain part of a mazar, I don't care how egalitarian they are, they don't have the potential to change these things. And, and while mystical Islam is being propped up as better Islam here, um, I mean, remember, the Wahhabis have picked up jihad as their alternative way of changing the world. Uh, the, uh, in the Indian and Pakistani context, the blasphemy laws are the ones picked up by the mystical branches of Islam. And in both their cases, the extreme form is always death to the to the perpetrators. So no, I don't play much st stock in like a general Sufism and its ability to destroy gender, even though there are female mystics like Rabia Basri and others. But no, in my opinion, yes. okay. Uh, so I'm going to stop the questions here because they are going slightly off topic. Uh, but that's all I have for this week. And I will come back and talk to you next week and hope we have a wonderful conversation. And I will post what we'll be doing next week on the community tab of the channel and on the website. Thank you so much. And you all have a wonderful weekend. I will now see you next week. All right. Peace and love.